Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so glad that you've joined us. We're studying the Sabbath School lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this set of lessons is for the third quarter of 2012. It's a series of lessons discussing First and Second Thessalonians in the Scriptures, and we're finishing up the book of First Thessalonians, the letter from Paul entitled First Thessalonians. This is lesson number 10 in that series for September 8 of 2012. Would you please bow your heads with us as we begin? Our kind and loving Father, once again, we are so thankful for what has been left to us by your apostles, your prophets, with the, with the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the chance we've had to learn more about you through these inspired words, and may that relationship grow until someday we can actually see you in person is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So, First and Second Thessalonians. This particular lesson is entitled Church Life, and it's going to talk a lot about how you get along in the church and, and things that will help to us not to have problems in getting along in the church. Um, in the last half of the last chapter of First Thessalonians, Paul threw a lot together, threw together a lot of individual bits of advice for church leaders and church members. There are actually 17 different admonitions in verses 12 through 20, followed by a closing prayer, which is verses 23 to 27. There are three admonitions about how local church members should treat their leaders, followed by six commands regarding how local church leadership should behave toward their people. Then in verses 16 through 22, there are eight additional brief admonitions. Three of them deal with maintaining a positive Christian attitude, and five are on how to relate to new light in the form of prophecies. You think we need any of that kind of advice today? So why are there more statements about why the leaders should, how the leaders should treat the members than the, how the members should treat the leaders? You think it might be a, a problem of some kind there? Possibly. <laughs> well, we ended our discussion last week talking about how we should encourage one another and help one another. That's in verse 11 of chapter 5. So what do you think? Do church members tend to have more difficulty getting along with those outside the church or with other church members? How often have you seen churches almost split in half because of disagreement among the members? And sometimes it's something crazy like, what color of carpet should we put down? Or some crazy thing like that. Or whether we should, we should be allowed to eat cheese sandwiches. Or have guitars. Or have guitars or drums. Wow. Well, we've heard that it's been said that the church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum or a club for saints. Do patients in a hospital fight and argue with each other? Depends on the hospital. <laughs> Depends on the hospital. Most of them. Okay, listen, listen to the psychiatric nurse here. <laughs> I won't quote what I've heard here. <laughs> no, no, please, right. <laughs> but spare us. <laughs> in general, do you find that Adventist churches are places where it is safe to ask questions, even to speak your mind when you have an idea that may be a little different than what someone else thinks? Or do you get a bad response when you come up with a slightly different idea. Boy, there's very loud silence I'm hearing. Yeah, I'm <laughs> trying to think. There's different groups in the church, and some groups get along. Other groups seem to like to debate and argue. Other groups don't want you to bring anything up, and other groups welcome any kind of bizarre thought you may have. So you pick whatever kind of circus arena you want to go to, I guess, and so, they're all in one church. So the hope is if you have a church big enough that you can find a group that you fit with. They're all here, yes. <laughs> yeah, but not everybody goes to the university church. Yeah. There's an old saying that I think covers it, depends on whose ox is being gored. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, you know, another thing, uh, if Satan's attacking the church, it looks like he'll be He'll be looking for any possibility to, in there, to get in there and wedge people yeah, apart. Yeah. And it's going to be more than any other place, I think. So yeah. 
Yeah. Of course, we need well, more course. than I mean, other place to than any other place to guard against that. Where do you think Satan is going to attack? He's not going to attack his people who are relaxing on the Riviera. Well, yeah. that's one of the uh, things when I came into this church. I noticed how much strife and arguing is within the church, and that was one of the clues that I think Satan is here. Mm -hmm. uh, because the other churches were so smooth compared to <laughs> the ripply waters. Let, let's hope that that's a good sign. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I know somebody who feels nervous when he doesn't get persecuted or, or attacked in some way because he'll feel like, you know, he may not be doing anything substantial. Mm -hmm. The Greek word that's translated admonition here could possibly be translated knock some sense into their heads. <laughs> do, we, do, we need, do we need any of that? <laughs> I think you know, all churches, it doesn't matter what denomination, have mm -hmm. their problems. Yeah. If you got three people, you got problems. I, 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 <laughs> remember, two, I remember a Catholic <laughs> nun that I was working with at the time said to me, she said, Carrie, in our church has problems with alcohol. Yeah. And I'll leave it at that. She was more specific, but that's what it was. We see that in our church. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm sure you've all heard this story, and whether it's based on a true story back at the beginning or not, but it, it illustrates the point. The story is told about a little old lady who sat in the front of the church, and the preacher one, this was a Sunday morning, was talking about the sins of the church and things that should be fixed, and, and you know, she would say, Amen, brother. And then he would talk about somebody else's sin. Amen, brother. And he'd go on down the line. Like, amen, amen. And finally, he gets to the bottom, and he's talking about chewing tobacco. And that was her pet sin. And she's, ah, the preacher's meddling. quit preaching and gone to meddling now. <laughs> 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 so we don't want that kind of thing to happen. But was Paul talking about tough love here? What, what is supposed to be the role of the pastor and the church leader? Well, I mean, let, let's think in just general terms. One of the things that the pastor is supposed to do, or church leaders are supposed to do, is to help explain the scriptures so that we understand them better, right? Whether it's a Sabbath school teacher or the pastor, I mean, that's what we hope to accomplish by going to church, at least one of the main things. What happens if you go to church and the pastor says, well, a lot of you believe thus and so, but in fact, the Bible doesn't really teach that. Well, if he can back it up, and he and it's not a private um, interpretation. Yeah. Um, Does he do get do himself loved by doing that? What do you do if it is a private interpretation? I would prefer a non-private interpretation. <laughs> what do you do when it is a errant private interpretation? I usually delete the email. <laughs> 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 he, he sent me a me. <laughs> okay. You know, sometimes well, you need to be patient, though. Uh, yeah. That's exactly right. I mean, just because you have a pastor who uh, may be wrong on some issue, that's no reason to get all excited and say, "I got to quit the church and get out of here." Yeah. Yeah. We need to respect our leaders, even if they're wrong. Why should yeah. you sit and listen to someone who's wrong? I mean, that's well, if they're consistently wrong, that might be, that's a time when maybe you need to say something. And that's the next question. Is there ever a time when it's appropriate to, to speak up about the pastor, the local pastor, or maybe the conference leader, or maybe the general conference leader? Is that ever appropriate? I think there's some people that are waiting for the opportunity just to drop them the hat. Well, that's <laughs> why we have channels in the church, and they should be abided by. <laughs> but it's amazing that um, the church board, I've never seen them ask the congregation a question, and the representatives that go to these meetings and decide things, I've never seen the members polled. And so the, the thing needs to work smoothly, yeah. sort of um, uh, get input well, do we ever see um, people in the New Testament, let's say, for example, the church is being established, uh, critical of other church leaders? You bet. Where? Paul was very critical of Peter. Yeah. Boy, he, he let him have him with both barrels, didn't he? And what about Paul, what Paul said about the Judaizers? I'm sure they came claiming they were church leaders, 
Boy, he let them have it. Galatians 1, wow. And, and, and finally, uh, look, at, look at these verses, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. See if we can get, there we go. Um, what, let's start with verse 5. Paul is speaking now to the Corinthians about these so-called church leaders, if, we, if you will, who come in to try to destroy his work. I do not think that I am the least bit inferior to those very special so-called apostles of yours. Perhaps I am an amateur in speaking, which he certainly wasn't, but certainly not in knowledge. We have made this clear to you at all times and in all conditions. I did not charge you a thing when I preached the good news of God to you. I humbled myself in order to make you important. Was that wrong of me? While I was working among you, I was paid by other churches. And then drop down to um, verse 16. I repeat, no one should think that I'm a fool, but if you do, at least accept me as a fool so that I will have a little to boast of. Of course, what I'm saying now is not what the Lord would like me to say. You mean there's some verses in the Bible that God wouldn't like us to read or to say? In this matter of boasting, I'm really talking like a fool. But since there are so many who boast for merely human reasons, I will do the same. You yourselves are so wise and so gladly tolerate fools. You tolerate anyone who orders you about and takes advantage of you or traps you or looks down on you or even slaps you in the face. I am ashamed to admit that we were too timid to do those things. But if anyone dares to boast about something, I'm talking like a fool. I will be just as daring. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they Christ's servants? I sound like a madman, but I'm a better servant than they are. I have worked much harder, I have been in prison more times, I have been whipped much more, and I have been near death more often. Five times I was given the 39 lashes by, by the Jews. Three times I was whipped by the Romans, and once I was stoned. I have been in three shipwrecks, and once I spent 24 hours in the water. And this is before the shipwreck that we know, of, we read about in Acts. In my many travels I have been in danger from floods and from robbers and dangers from fellow Jews and from Gentiles. There have been dangers in the cities, dangers in the wilds, dangers in the high seas, and dangers from false friends. There have been work and toil. Often I have gone without sleep. I have been hungry and thirsty. I have often been without enough food, shelter, or clothing, and not to mention other things. Every day I am under the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Whenever someone is weak, then I feel weak too. When someone is led into sin, I am filled with distress. Should we take those verses out of the Bible because maybe God didn't want him to say those verses? Uh, well, he had a few things to say about these so-called church leaders, didn't he? That's okay. <laughs> but these were leaders that were not following the message of Jesus. Yeah. And so when you get church leaders that do not follow the Bible or the message of Jesus, you have a right to get riled. Are you saying that Peter wasn't following God's message? Well, he wasn't Not talking about point. Peter there. He was talking about the Judaizers. But earlier he was talking about Peter when Second Corinthians, uh, I mean, if in Galatians chapter 2. What was Peter doing that? He was misrepresenting God. Okay. He was, when the leaders from Jerusalem came down, Peter said, well, I used to eat with you Gentiles, but now I don't think I should do that anymore. It seems to me back then and even <laughs> now, it, it comes down to two things. There's a time for diplomacy and there's a time for head-on confrontation. Yeah. Now, wh why, would, why was he saying these things? Well, because people were misrepresenting God. They were, they were trying to undo everything that Paul had taught the Corinthians. But why, why would he talk about those things to fight that? Well, he's saying, if these people think that they are God's messengers and they have been through a lot in, in the process of trying to, to bring the message to you, compare them to me. So, do you think that they might have been hearing that too? I mean, it, it sounds like, here I've done all this stuff, and you get up off your armchair and you start preaching like, they, you know exactly what you're doing. Yeah. And I've gone through all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Paul goes on. Look at First Thessalonians Five, now starting with verse 14. We urge you, our brothers and sisters, to warn the idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Warn, encourage, help, be patient. 
See that no one pays back wrong for wrong, but at all times make it your aim to do good to one another and to all people. Okay? I mean, what an, I mean, how could you argue with any of that? And then going on to verse 16. Be joyful always. Pray at all times. Be thankful in all circumstances. This is what God wants from you in your life and union with Christ Jesus. Is that possible? Be joyful always? Pray at all times? Be thankful in all circumstances? Isn't that, isn't that, that's, 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 that's going a little too far, right? I, I rejoice see, in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. I, I oh, can see can the power that. in that. I can see the power in that if everybody was arguing and they weren't glad, they weren't happy, they weren't, you know, because everybody's kind of getting at each other. So it's almost like, do this other stuff, do what it takes to get into that other stuff. Well, you know, if you're praying and you're saying your list of woes, it becomes a very depressing prayer. And it's so much nicer, I have found, to just thank for this and thank for that. And if you're in a situation, uh, thank you that you're going to help me, show me what to do. Uh, because um, I don't want to, I don't want to sit and cry after every prayer of all the woes of all the people I know because then I wouldn't want to pray anymore because it's such a depressing experience. But just to yeah. say, you know, God, thank you for this you've done, thank you for that, and uh, help me with this, and uh, here's a little something, and what should I do in this circumstance, and, and thank you for your guidance. And that way it keeps it on a positive note, and you're mm -hmm. still discussing the items, but you feel so much better inside. Okay. Let's, let's take a, we've been doing some pretty heavy theology. Let's do a little bit of trivia for a second. What's the shortest verse in the Bible? In English or? Depends what language. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, you people are, your people are too, too wise here already. Um, most people, English speaking people, oh, that's John eleven thirty five, 35, right? Jesus wept. Well, I would like to propose a couple of other verses these ones we're studying for today, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, and 17. First less, well, the word in John eleven thirty five, Jesus wept is actually a dakrasan ha yesu. It's actually three words. By comparison, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 is only two Greek words, pantote harate. And 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 is also only two Greek words, adialeptos pras yukastha. Two words. Those are long, long words. Long words. <laughs> so if you're going to be really technical, you got to start counting the letters. And it turns out now we, it's not really quite fair here because. Yes, <laughs> Well, you start counting here because some of the Greek letters, like CH, is one Greek letter and so forth. So, but anyway, counting it the way we counting it, we count them. Pantotechirata is the shortest in Greek, the original language of the New Testament. Adakrasan Hayesu would be the second shortest, and Adialeptos Prashukastha would be the third shortest. But there's, of course, a whole bunch of, you know, nonsense, okay, trivia about nothing, because... What do they mean? Well, Adakrasan Hayesu means uh, Jesus wept. Uh -huh. But the other or two. The, literally, he wept the Jesus, is what it, the way it is in Greek. By comparison, Pantote Chirata, Pantote means everyone, at all times, it could be at all something. Rejoice, kairata, rejoice. And First Thessalonians five seventeen is adia leptos prashyukasta. Pray at all times without pray without ceasing, literally. So the shortest would be all rejoice. Rejoice evermore. We, however you choose to translate that. And pray always. And then second would be Jesus wept, and third would be pray always or pray without ceasing. Which of course is a lot, a whole lot of business because of course there were no verses and no chapters in the in the Bible in the beginning anyway so a lot of trivia. It's fun to take a little break once Would in a while. that be a Jeopardy question? That might be a Jeopardy big, big question. <laughs> well, but let's get back to the really big question. Is it really practical? Is it, I mean is this, is this feasible that you could be thankful always and, and, and pray at all times? I mean isn't that just probably going a little over the edge? I think it's what they want us. To, he wa God wants us to strive for this. You're not always going to hit it first time. That's mm -hmm. for sure. 
What if your best friend just died? You're supposed to say, thank the Lord. Huh? Well, there, I understand in Islam, whatever happens is God's will. And so they, they can be happy when good people die. They can be happy when bad people die. They, they have no... It's fate. Yeah, it's just God it's, already God, planned God, it. Yeah, so it depends where your what your paradigm is, where you're coming from. Yeah, but we don't need to look to them. No, for sure. <laughs> where do we need to look? Well, think about people in the Bible. We, we, we last week we talked about Job and the awful things that happened to him. But what did he always have through all that experience? His trust in God. Would he have survived without that trust in God? No. 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 So here is, he may not have been joyful, but at least he had, he could pray, and he was thankful for what he had in his relationship with God. Right? So he can be thankful he, about... He, he was wondering why he couldn't get answers like he used to. Exactly. So he was, he was yeah, he, exactly. He was, he was wondering what had happened to that relationship, but it was right. that relationship that kept him going. Right. Yeah. Um, well... What about that? Does anybody have any other concerns about this? Was Jesus rejoicing on the crest of the Mount of Olives, looking over at Jerusalem as he was weeping uncontrollably? I don't think so. No. He looks out and they're his people. And maybe the best way to express that is to quote one of the verses from John, the first chapter. John 1, cha chapter 1, verse 11. It's the saddest verse, I think, in the whole Bible. He came to his family. It literally says in the Greek, he came to his family, but his, I'm sorry, he came to his home, but his family rejected him. He came home and his family rejected him. So should we change that text? Uh, say that you don't have to rejoice always. Well, what about that? Do we, do we, do we need, does it make a difference whether we should how we behave and how we, you know, express ourselves. Does that matter? Let me, let me read you these words from Ellen White. This is taken from Ministry of Healings 251.4, and there's just a few lines in, in 252 and then the top of 253. It is a law of nature. Now, a law means what? It's the way things work. It's the way things work. Just like gravity. Yeah. It's a law of nature that our thoughts and feelings are encouraged and strengthened as we give them utterance. While words express thoughts, it is also true that thoughts follow words. I don't know how many of you have had this experience, but maybe something you really didn't really believe, but you're in an argument with somebody and you say, eh, da, 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 da. and then you feel like you have to follow through with that because you stated it. Any, no, no, none of you would make that kind of mistake. Would you? <laughs> <laughs> Say maybe, that again. You know, maybe that's, okay. that's a man thing. Oh, okay. We can change our minds, right? Yes. <laughs> but no. is it true that thoughts follow words? I thought thoughts preceded words. From, well, from the heart, a man speaketh. Yeah, it, and, and that's the one side. But the other side is when you speak something, you're actually reinforcing it, and the next time you're going to feel more certain about it, and the more times you speak about it, the more certain you are of it. Tell a lie often enough, and pretty soon you become to believe it. That's where your thought follows words. Mm -hmm. That is happening in our world, yes. Yeah. Well, reading on, if we would give more expression to our faith, rejoice more, remember our, our verses we're looking at, rejoice more in the blessings that we know we have, the great mercy and love of God, we should have more faith and greater joy. No tongue can express, no finite mind can conceive the blessing that results from appreciating the goodness and love of God. Even on earth, we may have joy as a wellspring never failing because fed by the streams that flow from the throne of God. We don't have time to look at it here, but an example of that kind of thinking is what Ellen White wrote when she wrote after the death of her husband. Mm. And, it, and it expresses all the joy and stuff, the pain, yes, but all of the blessings that she was so thankful for. Mm. Yeah. You know, there's, there's another thing. Mm -hmm. There's another thing that um, I remember one time that I thought I was going to get ice cream after the dinner. 
<laughs> and um, so I finished dinner, and there was no ice cream. Oh Boy, I was down in the dumps. Man, I thought that was the worst thing that could happen because I just really wanted that ice cream. But, you know, if you start thinking about you got a meal mm -hmm. at the beginning, you know, it kind of reminds you that, you know, all is not lost. You still had a meal. It was a good you meal. Might you might live until on the another meal comes around. You might get ice cream at that meal. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and then you start thinking about this stuff. It's just a kind of a way to get your mind off, you know, things that don't work very well. And you so, so what about it? Should we be giving thanks more often? Should we be rejoicing more often? And how would that impact us? Could we actually promote a healthier, happier, holier life by rejoicing and giving thanks more often. Absolutely. When I hear something that bothers some people, but I absolutely believe it, this is Ellen White speaking in another place. Uh, it can be found in Adventist Home, pages 430, page 432, Child Guidance, page 148. It was originally in Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 62. And this sounds phony to people, but I want you to think about it for a moment. Smile, parents. Smile, teachers. If your heart is sad, let not your face reveal the fact. Let the sunshine from a loving, grateful heart light up the countenance. Unbend from your iron dignity. Adapt yourself to the children's needs and make them love you. You must win their affection if you would impress religion, religious truth upon their heart. Doesn't that sound phony? <laughs> no, it sounds planned. Planned. Say more. It sounds, it sounds like here is a, in a time of distress, here is a plan to get around the distress the best way. Okay. It says be positive to those who are very impressionable. Okay. Yeah. And how, how do we do that? By our attitude. Well, you know, kids are scared mm -hmm. when they see adults under anxiety, stress, or whatever. They're scared. And it may affect them more than it is affecting you because you're scaring them. Well, let me, let that me just isn't give a the real reason, is it? I mean, let, I mean, let, let me give an example. The last patient I saw at the clinic this afternoon was a young lady who's 18 years old. And her parents have been squabbling and recently, I think officially now, are divorced. And she has taken it upon herself as if it's all her fault, and she is personally responsible for everything that's going on there. And she has lost like 25 pounds, and she didn't have 25 pounds to lose. Mm -hmm. She looks like a stick figure almost. Mm -hmm. And it's just eating her. Mm -hmm. And what is happening? I mean, this young, life, this young lady's life is being ruined, and we're hoping that we can, with counseling and so forth, and, and talking to the mother and the father, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to get things straightened out. But, I mean, her life is, is a mess right now. Mm -hmm. So, now let's, let's look at the big picture once again. Do we have a Heavenly Father that loves us? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do we have a Jesus who showed us the way? Do we have a Godhead who plans for us the most incredible future in heaven and back on this earth made new? Are those reasons why we should be sad and pouting and, and, and moping ourselves around the world? No. I mean, right now you may be in a funk. You may think, oh, well, this is terrible. But the long-term picture is what? Hope. Absolutely. And, the, and you mentioned Jesus' role in this thing. Nobody has suffered like he did. No. I mean, the, the, the stress that he was under uh, was, is incomparable. We, we just want to get a glimpse of it. it. And nobody gets out of this life without some suffering. The Creator suffered at the hands of his creatures. Yeah. Well, yeah. Ja uh, Japanese cultures, Early in most businesses, big companies, early in the morning they get together and everybody force laughs for a good 10 minutes. Ha 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 But they found that it increased uh, productivity and morale, which yeah. is good. <laughs> so and some exercise helps too. Yeah. So things follow other things. 
and you want to put the, you can lead the first thing in and you'll have the beneficial thing come in. So when you mope around, especially around your children, what are you suggesting? That life is hopeless. God doesn't have enough to take care of. God me. isn't able to take care of me. God is not able to take, and therefore may not be able to take care of you. That's right. That's not it. That's not only to the children, that's mm -hmm. to yourself. Yeah. Exactly. Yourself. But have you seen these people that are coping well and relying on God through crises? They are such an inspiration. Mm -hmm. Such an inspiration. Yeah. yeah. Well, those truths, what we mentioned about God and so forth, those are truths we need to grasp onto and hold and never let go of them. And never let any temporary upset or, or I mean, I don't care if it's a bankruptcy, you know. That's still only temporary. Even we must never let that take our minds off of what we know is a potential glorious future. Even the Sunday law and the plagues? Yeah. <laughs> well, we've talked quite a bit about the book of Job and all we should learn about it. Do you think Job was rejoicing as he lived through the experiences of Job 1 and 2? I mean, how could he? He loses all his children. He loses all his possessions. His wife is saying, curse God and die. I mean, you know, where do you go from there? He went to his maker. He went to God and was so frustrated because he couldn't talk to God like he knew he should be able to. He was going where he should and ultimately he says, I know him well enough. Even if he slays me, I'm still going to trust him because that's the only thing I can bet on. Well, you know, Adam ran away from God and hid. Job ran to God. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so maybe that's what we're supposed to learn in times of crises, run to God. Yeah. Have you ever asked yourself what kind of relationship Job had with God before all that happened and how did he develop that kind of relationship? Yes. It must have been yeah. similar to, a to Abraham. Abraham too. Yeah. yeah. It must have been awesome. It wasn't because he was reading the Bible, though, was it? No, he didn't have the Bible. He didn't have church to go to. He didn't have a pastor. None of that. So we have advantages that he didn't have. We have all kinds of advantages. We, we even have his story to look at. Now, so how do you, what do you think was the equivalent of Bible study for him? Well, I think he probably co had conversations with the angels or with God. I think God said, here's someone who who really wants to have a relationship with me, let, let's help him. Now, had he, he was before Moses, right? Yes. So he had had... The, Maybe before Abraham, but somewhere about that time. So he had the incidences of Adam in the Garden of Eden, mm, yeah. and that whole... So that was passed down to him through verbal stories? Presumably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, if I had experiences with angels... I think that would <laughs> that would be an advantage to me. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I've, I've talked to groups. In fact, I think I may have brought it up here. At least I brought it up in my other classes. How would you like to have a half an hour every week with God? Would love it. We Wouldn't that be awesome? That. That's huh? what the Sabbath is. Yeah, that's what well, the Sabbath is. He doesn't, he doesn't materialize in front of us, yeah. but How he still every day? Has, it's a date. The problem with that, of course, is if you had a date with God where you physically appeared and you could spend a half an hour with him, guess who would demand equal time? <laughs> How would you like to spend a half an hour once a week one-on-one -on -one with the devil? No, thank you. <laughs> but, uh, so that's why that doesn't well, happen, you think? I think so. Well, I could Can have, have to think about that. Can having the Bible be somewhat of a detriment? <laughs> because we may spend too much time in the particulars and not even enough time in the relationship, the heart-to-heart -heart relationship with well, God. Well, I, I, I think that I find spending time with the Bible is a wonderful experience. I, I enjoy doing that. I mean, I, I think that's the way God's supposed to speak to us. Well, okay, let's, let's, let's be very practical. Yeah. Probably all in a, a lot in how you go yeah. about your study of the Bible. Yeah. If it's well, let's see. There's uh, the number seventeen over here. What does the number seventeen mean? You know, <laughs> or is it really saying what does this say about God? Yeah. If it's what does this say about God, then it's 
productive. Yep. If it's what does the number 17 mm -hmm. mean, it's probably not. Absolutely. Well, so praying without ceasing, is that possible or is that just fairy talk? It's by kind of prayer. There are those in this day and age that literally do that in the Himalayas, but it doesn't seem to do too much for them. I have, I have, I have, and I won't mention any names, but I have some friends who have come to me with a great burden that if you, if you really want to pray, you've got to be down on your knees. <laughs> what would you do with that? Well, I'd, they say, I'd be in big trouble. They say you're never closer to God than in a garden. And in a garden, there's usually no one with you, and you can talk to God about this plant and that plant and that plant and that plant, and mm -hmm. and so that's a praying without ceasing. Is or you're strolling through the forest, okay, or you're in crisis, Let me, or, or you're, you're in, in crisis, or you're happy, you're celebrating. Well, how do you, how are you supposed to interpret that when you come into a Bible verse like that? It says pray without ceasing. Okay, because to me, I've I've always said that that girl is always talking. Mm -hmm. And you know what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't mean that she's always talking. I pick her up, move her over here, and she's still jabbering, you know, like she, like her mouth is stuck. I shouldn't have used a girl specifically. But that was Who are you mistake. talking yeah, about? Yeah, I shouldn't yeah. have done that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you get yourself um, in trouble, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, there's some guys, too, that, that always are talking or always joking. I'd say this guy's always joking, mm -hmm. you know, and... So is he well, always joking? Let, let, me, let me see if I can help you with this one. Do we believe, now, this is theoretically maybe now, do we believe that God is omnipresent? Okay, we'll he, say yes. He's everywhere, yes. okay? So is he right here right now? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I hope so. So if he's here right now and we're praying, what are we, what are we actually doing? We're recognizing his presence, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one world-renowned theologian has said, when we talk about praying without ceasing, what we're really doing is we're practicing the presence of God. Practicing the presence of God. Recognizing that God is here at all times. How different would your life be if you honestly, 24-7, at least as much as you're awake, recognize that God is right there with you? How much difference would that make in the way you live? Might not argue. Don't so don't much. look at anybody else. No, I'm just saying <laughs> I might no not argue so much with. Oh, I see with, with your who? hubby, the with effect, the one next to me. <laughs> the effect it has on your life is how would you do you conduct yourself when you don't think he's around? Yeah, that's really what you are. Just, if the parent is looking at the kids, the kids are behaving. But how do the, how are the kids? Not when the parents are not looking. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> using it as a metaphor. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, the dividing point is you can pray as much and where you want, but when it starts to interfere with the activities, the basic activities yeah. of daily life, something's wrong. Yeah. What about the 144,000? Do you think that um, they will be rejoicing about everything they go through? Yes. Why? In hindsight, in hindsight, I'm sure they will. <laughs> in hindsight. Now, I'm not talking about the hindsight. <laughs> won't, won't they be like Job, questioning but hanging on? I think they will say, God, I don't know why all this is happening to us. I mean, I've read the scriptures. I understand all that. But I don't know. Uh, it's worse than I thought. Stick, <laughs> yeah, stick with me. I, I trust you. Yes. Furthermore, when that other guy comes along claiming to be Christ, the picture you've taught me about yourself, I'm going to know he's wrong. Okay? So, picking that thought up, to what, to what extent does your picture of God impact your daily life? Does it make a difference? Absolutely. You know, there's an interesting phenomenon which some people have studied. There's, um, you can go to Christian churches and you could take polls and you can say, what do you believe? I, be I believe this and this and this and this and this. But yet, when it comes time to look at their behavior, 
Christian's behavior is not that much different than worldling's behavior. We have just as many divorces, we have as many bankruptcies, we have as many this and that and the others. The stats for Christians are just, I mean, of course, you can say, well, maybe they're not really Christians, but, I mean, those who call themselves Christians, the stats for them are just about the same as it is for everybody else in the world. On the other hand, when people know that you're behaving in a certain way, they will very seldom, very seldom claim that they believe something that's inconsistent with their behavior. Think about that for a moment. They can say, I believe this, but I'm over here doing this. However, if they say, if you know this is what they're actually doing, it's very unlikely they're going to say, I, don't, I believe something different than what I'm doing. Why do you suppose that is? Does behavior dictate belief more than belief dictates behavior? Mm. You may pick a belief to go along with what behavior you want to uh, do. And so you that. shop Very for, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, when it comes time to pray, it's um, a good place to look is in the book of Psalms. There are some Psalms that are almost scary to read. David and some of his friends said some very, very incredible things. Look at Psalm 18, for example, and 22 and 69. David talks about stamping on his friends and smashing their blood and all, ooh boy, all kinds of stuff there in the book of Psalms. But he ends up by doing what? God, you know, created a clean, clean heart in me and renew a right spirit within me, right? And almost every Psalm, pretty much all of them, end up with a positive note. And, and that's why they're appropriate. Perhaps. When you're angry and you've been stabbed in the back or anything else, the Psalms are a very good um, book to read. And then you start thinking, my gosh, I wouldn't even say this about uh, some of the things that David said. Mm -hmm. And so then, and then it brings you back to God. So it's a very good book to read to cool anger. Yeah. There's a, we also have an interesting handout on the book of Psalms uh, found at our website. It's at www theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And you can find these materials that we're using as study guides as we have our discussions together at that website also. Um, there's lots of materials there that might be of use to you. Help yourself. You might say that the book of, the guide on the book of Psalms is under teacher's guides. Yes. The well, there's a, website. there's a study guide. You can look at the questions and see how you would have answered the questions, and then you can go to the teacher's guides and see how we answered the questions. Okay. Well, how much access does Satan have to us? As much as God allows. Do we have any control over that? Yeah. How do we control Satan's access to us? I think one, the first thing is to realize that he's there, because okay. when you don't think he's there, you start bl you start thinking that think problems are coming from other places. So, um, why is it that so many Christians are now denying the very existence of Satan? I think it's just, he's just a metaphor, but um, you know, if you have the great controversy mm -hmm. outlook. You, you you have a place for him, you know, where he fits. Yeah. And has if you there don't, been, well then... Has there been too much uh, prosperity preaching and that... Um, we, that we don't want to believe that there's somebody out there who impersonates evil. That, 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 you know, that scares people. Well, Dr. Richard Neese, uh, one of our friends of many of us here, uh, who unfortunately has passed on now, but uh, he had some very interesting things to say about this thing, and he, he did this based on his study of the book of Revelation. He said, far too many of us allow ourselves to be almost manipulated by our circumstances. If the circumstances are fine and good, then we're happy. If the circumstances are bad, we're moping around, whatever like this. And he said, if you allow yourself to be manipulated by your circumstances, then the devil is going to find a way to control those circumstances sooner or later. 
and you are going to therefore be controlled by the devil. Could that technically be called demon possession? It is very hard to not be controlled by your circumstances. So you have to stand as an anchor while the waves go this way and the waves go that way. Yeah. I think possession's got more than one meaning. There's a depth there. Yeah. I would answer that may or may not, maybe, maybe not, but if you start to dabble with him and his pals, you're in for a whole different book. Yeah, that's also true, but I think that that the devil is going to control a lot more of us just by subtly without our even really knowing it. Well, you know, I would agree. Yeah. The, my favorite uh, thing that Jesus said is, Satan has nothing in me. Mm -hmm. It's almost like Jesus said, there is no handle in me that Satan can grab a hold of and slam me to the ground. And I think it would be so nice to be able to say, Satan has nothing in me, because it feels like Satan rips you this way, and then he rips you that way. Is that what Jesus meant when he says, Satan has nothing in me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we live at a time, and let me speak from something I know as a, as a physician. We live at a time in history when people think that feeling good is the ultimate goal. And they don't want to ever feel bad. They want to feel good all the time. And if necessary, I'll take a whole handful of pills to feel good. We don't want to experience pain. We don't want depression. We don't want sadness. We, want, we don't want any kind of bad feeling of any kind. And the pharmaceutical industries has built a billion dollar, multi, multi, multi billion dollar business based on this idea. While we recognize that certain chemical imbalances may cause problems in our brains, and it's appropriate to try to rebalance those, those imbalances, so hopefully the brain can function correctly, to what extent are we opening ourselves up to Satan's control when we demand to always have the right kind of feelings? Well, you know, the Wall Street Journal did an article, and it said we have a generation of young adults now who were brought up, and a high percentage of them took pills. Um, uh, um, these pharmaceutical pills, They're, they didn't want to experience adolescence and the trauma that adolescents have in, in growing up into yeah. young adults. And these people are wondering who they are. They don't know how they react to circumstances without the pills. Do they quit the pills now or do they take them their whole life and they're, they're like lost. They say they don't know themselves. They've mm -hmm. never been able to experience and work through things. Mm -hmm. I think the idea of actually being happy, 100% of the time, people think that that's in their grasp. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's possible. All I need is a few things and that'll happen. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing is money. If you've yeah. got a lot of money, well, then you can do anything you can to keep yourself up, happy, all the time. Well, but you find out after a while that money doesn't do that. <laughs> and so after a while, they start saying, well, take this stuff. Yeah. Maybe, maybe a little more alcohol. Maybe this, maybe free sex, you know, whatever it is. And, and it just kind of goes downhill to try to keep that happiness yeah. all the time. And that's, it's a lie. I mean, we go through all kinds of... Everybody goes through, you know, I problems. can remember, I remember back in years and years and years ago when I was in college, it was popular to put interesting little slogans on, print them out on little like, you know, I guess it was those are what, five by eight cards and put them up in your, on, your, on the walls of your room and that kind of stuff in the dormitory. And one of them says, you mentioned about money. One of these things, I, I chuckle when I think about it, says, Money isn't everything, but it's way ahead of whatever's in second place. <laughs> <laughs> and if that doesn't make it, well, then you're in trouble. You know, I, another thing that's happening now is, is Facebook good? Yeah. Facebook shows I'm happy, I'm having fun, look at what I'm doing, look at... And then other people look at that and they say, why is my life not so interesting? When really, if you know some of these people, their life is not that interesting, but Facebook makes it look like it's. Yeah. And what are we doing here? Yeah, they're just good writers. Bottom line is <laughs> yeah. you can't trust your feelings. Yeah. Well, and never underestimate the devil. Remember that he convinced 
one third of the heavenly angels, you can read about that in Revelation 12, to stop trusting God even while they were living in the very presence of God. How are we going to face up to that? How could that even be possible? At the end of time, there will be two great individuals coming, both claiming to be Jesus Christ. The only way we can be safe is to be so certain and grounded in the truth about God that we will never be deceived by any counterfeit. Now, those two individuals will not be coming at the same time. No. First, we're going to get the false. Well, the devil isn't so foolish as to be the first one to come. He's going to have probably a whole list of people who come before him more and more persuasive as time goes by. That would be my guess, knowing what little I know. I try not to be too uh, much of an expert about the devil. But uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm smart enough to think that he's a lot smarter. Like before Jesus came, there were other people that yep. called themselves Messiah. Okay. When the devil arrives and conducts the most successful evangelistic campaign of all time, and the whole world wanders after him, read about it in Revelation 13, will we be like these people described by Ellen White? And here I, I read again from her words. This is volume four of the Bible commentary, page 1161, paragraph six. It's in Faith I Live by, page 287.7. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, Revelation 7, Revelation 14 talks about the sealing. It is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth. A settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. Amen to that. So what, what's holding off? The second coming? The sealing? We're not, we're not sealed. We're not, God says, and, and I could read you a lot of other passages, evangelism pages 694 to 697 is full of them, saying God can't come now. He can't let the devil have increased access to us. Otherwise, too many of us would fall away. So look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 to 21. Do not restrain the Holy Spirit. Do not despise inspired messages. Put all things to the test. Keep what is good and avoid every kind of evil. Okay? Do not restrain the Holy Spirit. Do not despise inspired messages. Put all things to the test. And when you put it to the test, you put it to the test as it compares to the Bible? Yes. Yeah. So now I'm going to ask this question. What about the writings of Ellen White? Are, are the, is the Adventist Church today treating them the right way? Or are we elevating them too high? Are we putting them down too low? What about that? It says we're supposed to, you know, let me which, read the exact words well, again. Which section of the church? Do not despise inspired m messages. I think we've done, we've done both extremes, mm -hmm. too much, too little. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember when I was a kid, it seemed like there was a lot of people taking Ellen White and hitting people over the head with it. And now it seems like it's the other way around, that people are trying to use the truths that she has and they're not listening. So mm -hmm. it's just back and forth. Mm -hmm. As an African, uh, Caribbean, African American, I've had a seven day Adventists try to kind of turn me, purposely try to turn me away from Ellen Rice reading, pulling out things that are just, you know, to kind of inflame you and turn you. And I never quite understood why, why that was. But at the, in the same way, I don't like when people speak more of her writing than of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it's like they put Ellen White instead of Christ sometimes. I don't, I feel a little scared. Yeah. Uneasy about that sometimes. Well, how many Adventist church members do you know of who are carefully studying her writings, learning what they can about the final deceptions and the final events that take place in our world? How many Adventists are choosing to ignore bits of her advice that they, they do not like? What did Paul mean when he said, do not restrain the Holy Spirit, do not inspire, and I'm sorry, do not despise inspired messages? However, 
he did go on to say, put all things to the test, keep what is good, and avoid every kind of evil. Has Ellen White passed that test? Yes. I, to Leo, to Yoli's point, mm -hmm. I would say that if the person who is talking about Ellen White is not letting that lead to Christ, they're misusing her. Mm -hmm. But she herself says that, said mm -hmm. to test everything, to test her own yeah, writing. Absolutely. Yeah. What did she mean when she said she was a lesser light to point to the greater light? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what mm -hmm. you're just talking That's about. Seventh-day Adventists have been famous for the idea of present truth. For decades we had a magazine by that name. But we, but we do believe that every present truth must agree with all previously revealed truth. We don't abandon the old truth so we can take up new truth. We do not believe that present truth will be given to overthrow a previous truth. Is our faith based on solid evidence? And you remember uh, Steps to Christ, page 105. God never asks us to believe anything for which he does not provide what? Evidence. Adequate evidence, and it's evidence that appeals to our reason. Well, in this passage, or in these verses that we've been studying, 1 Thessalonians 5, we have seen Paul going back and forth, talking about the two different sides of various issues, church leaders versus members, how to avoid extremes. Are we being constructively critical enough about our pastors? Are we too critical? Are we taking inspired revelation seriously enough? What have you learned from our study of 1 Thessalonians so far? How do you think you would have fit into the church at Thessalonica? What would you do if you were in Thessalonica as you understand it. We're running out of time, but... I would not want to listen to the Judaizers. Yeah? Okay. I would want to listen to Paul. He was more credible. Yeah. Well, that's nice to say. <laughs> yeah, it's kind that's of going post. what we know now. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's great hindsight, yes. Mm -hmm. Who are the Judaizers of our time? Yes, that would be the question to ask. Who are the Judaizers of our time? Are there, are, there, are there those who in the church try to twist what the church is supposed to be all about? One way, maybe pulling too far to one side or too far to the other side. And how do we avoid those kind of misinterpretations and misleading things? And the only safety that I know of is for each one of us to take our Bibles in hand to try to understand it, to sit down with our friends as we're doing here, talk about it, and, and get the truth for ourselves. May that be your experience also.